Sam, it's really lovely to have you here to talk about uh, why Anzac. I mean, I'm interested in the New Zealand-Australia connection, and you're perfectly suited to sit right across that bridge. Um, yeah, it's interesting you should say that, because I did ask the producers, why did you approach me to do this uh, at all? And, and one of them said, because um, if you say the word we, people understand it on both sides of the Tasman. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, an, it was interesting uh, going back through your personal history mm. and taking that journey through um, Guy Bridgeway uh, through this Anzac story. Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't interested in making a sort of dry history about, um, about anything to do with Anzac because I think it's a sort of... Uh, it, it had to be visceral because we all sort of... I, I don't think there's any family in Australia or New Zealand that's, that's untouched by the Anzac experience. So I thought um, the, the best way to tunnel through this was to, to, to explore the personal. And I, and I think um, if I was to... You know, it had to involve my family. Otherwise, it didn't really mean anything. But there's nothing particularly remarkable about my family. But it stands in for so many other families. And um, I think if I'd, I was to um, dedicate the film to anyone, it would be to my grandmother, who lost her husband, my grandfather, in the First War. Yeah. And, um, and one thing we don't mention in the film is she also lost her, her only son, my Uncle John, um, just in action, just after the second war, he, he, he was killed on the border of, of Afghanistan, a place where we keep getting ourselves into trouble. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's as much about family, it's about our family, it's about the family of Anzac, the Australian-New Zealand family, in, in a wider sense too. Yeah. I lost a grandfather at uh, Gallipoli as well. Um, or because of injuries suffered at Gallipoli, and uh, mm. you have a sense that, that the grief, really, and sorrow just run through the DNA of, of all of us in both countries. Yes, I mean, talking about my grandmother, you know, it, it, it occurred to me so late in life, of course, she was a widow, you know, mm. and, and just something that you grew up with, and then, uh, oh, my God, what sort of effect mm. has that had on our family um, down the generations? But um, it's... You know, when you think of how many people were killed in that war, how many people died in the second war, something like 50 million. That's, that's an awful lot of grief. Why do you think the joint element here was ignored for so long? Uh, you know, there's been a, a huge amount of discussion over the years about the Australian experience, but, but right. so little that we're aware of of the New Zealand experience. I think probably the same thing has happened <laughs> over the other side. <laughs> probably, yes, yes. Sam, you're... Yeah quite a private person, really, mm -hmm. and exposing, you know, very personal stuff in this film. Mm. And, you know, really a lot of emotion on, on your part as well. Mm. I mean, I think that... Can we just have a look at a little bit of the film where I think that's reflected? Mm. Four weeks after the landing and after appalling casualties, my cousin Guy Bridgman and the Otago Mounted Rifles were rushed in as reinforcements. They had to leave their mounts behind. This was no place for horses and no place for men come to that. Relentless shelling and sniping from the Turks above, bad food, disease, blood, shit, and the complete horror of seeing your mate's head removed in the blink of an eye right next to you. It was a gruesome stalemate. The two sides hunkered down in parallel trenches, sniping and machine gunning one another. In some places, the trenches were so close we could see, hear, and even smell the enemy. Strangely, we began to identify with these Turks. Men as resolute, exhausted, and dirty as ourselves. Fred Dill of the Auckland Mounted Rifles says, We found the Turks clean fighters. They were honorable fighters. We had quite a respect for him. When we saw him when he was in the army, we tried to kill him, but we had no personal feeling against the Turk. Was it an emotional experience for you? Yes, I'm, look, um, we, we had a wonderful um, small crew. Uh, Creve Standers, who directed it, was a complete lifesaver. Yeah. And um, we travelled fast, we travelled light. And what surprised me was how 
blindsided I was to be in these places where all these men died and where my, my, my father and my grandfather served and so many of my family to be there. And, I, you know, th this is not a unique experience. I, I think this happens to um, so many of us when we, when we visit yeah. these places. And um, so sort of things happened in the course of filmmaking that um, totally took me by surprise. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I found interesting in the film was that your political stance comes through mm. loud and clear. Yes, your opposition to militarism in general is, is yes. placed on the, the counter very quickly at the start of the film. Yes, I, I, look, I, I wouldn't say I'm a pacifist by any means, mm. um, not at all. I think it's important to serve your country and so many of my family, for instance, have served their country, you know, and with, with distinction and I'm proud of that. But I could have made, we could have made a much angrier film. I think it's well balanced and thoughtful. Um, personally, I'm, I mean, there are things like our involvement in Iraq, for instance, that completely enraged me. <laughs> but uh, I had to keep, um, I had to keep that out of it a bit. So I think it's probably uh, better balanced than if I'd, if I'd been given my head <laughs> completely. <laughs> it would have been a much angrier film. For instance, uh, it. it I, I can't think of anything good that came out of the first war. All that sacrifice for what? For what? You know, I, I, no one's really. No. You know, then we had the Treaty of Versailles. Then we split up the Ottoman Empire. We won the war, but we didn't end it at all well. It was no. dreadful. You say quite early in the film that the Anzac legend itself really emerged as a counter to the carnage and the reality of what actually happened. Yes, I think that's right. That, that was, it was important. Um, f for both our countries that we build this myth so that it made sense of something that, that no one could make sense of. Mm. And also you say that our history really begins there, that uh, because of what happened that we're able to turn our back on invasion and the treatment of... Yes. of, of uh... Well, that's one way of looking at it. That's, that's why, why it became such a potent myth, because, uh, uh, you know, certain historians see it that way, that, mm. that we were kind of saying history starts here. Don't worry about all that stuff that happened before, <laughs> all the convicts and dispossession and so on. Let's say we start here. We start, near, we start afresh. This is where our, our, our nations are forged. And the myth suggests that we will always prevail as, as soldiers and as men. Indeed, yeah. yeah. And it is, it is a, a strong and potent myth mm -hmm. and one that's still invoked today. And when I hear the word Anzac being used by politicians, my antenna go up immediately and I think, what's going on here? We, are we being pushed into something <laughs> for, that um, we, we shouldn't be pushed into? Mm -hmm. Sam, you wrote this. Um, I, mean, I co-wrote. Co-wrote, and I know, but, it, but this, I mean, it's quite a, um, an amazing hour and a half of writing, actually. Yeah. Uh, how did you approach it? Um, I think probably sort of fairly piecemeal. <laughs> there were just a, a lot of things that interested me and interested us. I'm really interested in, in, in what we choose to remember, what we choose to forget. I'm really interested in how we, how we memorialise things in, in Australia and New Zealand. And, and growing up in a pretty small place in New Zealand, you're very, 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 um, you're reminded constantly of, of the war. There's always a memorial around the corner. And there's always far too many names on those memorials in these tiny places. Mm. Um, there was a lot of things that... Um, so I, I thought um, uh, the film, rather than have a very kind of uh, defined backbone structure, it should be uh, a bit like a patchwork quilt mm. yeah. with all these threads running through it. And it's not until you actually put the quilt on the wall that you actually see what the pattern is. Mm. One of the great threads that runs right through it, of course, is Guy Bridgman. Mm. Uh... Guy Bridgman was... Um, uh, I, I had thought... Uh, I had a very close relation, um, possibly a grandfather that had fought at Gallipoli. It turned out not to be so. <laughs> but we found this cousin, Guy Bridgman, my father's mm. first cousin. I'd never heard of Guy. Mm. And um, we dug up all this stuff on Guy, and he, he becomes the sort of hero of the film. Mm. Yes, <laughs> and, he does. And I grew to absolutely love him, mm. you know, the, uh, from a man I didn't know anything about. But, you know, 
so many of my... Now I'm learning more and more, even after the film is finished, mm. that all these cousins turn up. Another first cousin of my <laughs> father's, I found out the other day, bailed out of a Spitfire twice in the course of the Second <laughs> War. Now, he must be the only man still alive that managed that. <laughs> Can we just see something of your affection for your relative in this whole affair? For me, this is an extraordinary photograph. It's a rare photo of a man on a stretcher. He's been shot at the Battle of Chanak Bear. He appears to be conscious, but he's been shot through the lung and through the arm. And it is, of all people, Guy Bridgman. Guy was evacuated to Malta and he lived to fight again. One of the lucky ones. You said off camera Guy was the gift that never <laughs> stopped giving. I know, yeah. We kept on digging up more stuff. And then I found, just a couple of weeks ago, a photo of Guy as, he, as, a, as, a, as a young boy in a kind of little frock. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Victorians were rather... Well, the Edwardians were rather cruel the way they <laughs> dressed their children. <laughs> but it's a, it's a big um, uh, album of my great-grandfather's of all his thousands of grandchildren uh, with, with their parents. And there's Guy with this little bonnet and frock on, <laughs> but he's being cuddled by his father. I thought, isn't that lovely, you know, on all these formal photographs of people propped up against chair. There's Guy being cuddled by his father, the only real uh, gesture of absolute love in this entire book. I, I thought it was completely amazing. He, you know, Stuff is keep, keeps coming up about Guy. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, that, um, you know, gradual and increasing acquaintanceship with your, mm. with Guy through the film and your obvious developing affection and admiration mm. for him mm. is really, really lovely. Mm. Uh, Sam, it, it's such a wonderful film. It's really, it's so really... touching, really, in so many different ways. It's just incredibly moving. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's really... Lovely to hear that. I mean, I, when, when you make something like this, we had no idea what people would make of it, but it's just we made it and hope for the best. No, you didn't. <laughs> well, it's worked. Mm. So Thanks congratulations. So Thank so. you very much. Thanks, sir. Thank you. My cousin Guy Bridgman was back. He was healed of his wounds. He was promoted to second lieutenant, and he found himself here in the thick of the epic battle of Passchendaele. And here he distinguished himself. He rescued one of his men, carried him back to safety, back to the trenches, under heavy German fire. Later, Guy was shot for the second time. His shoulder and arm ripped apart, and he was evacuated, this time back to Britain. Guy Bridgman spent months recovering in British hospitals. His only compensation, a visit to the King at Buckingham Palace on New Year's Day, 1918, to receive the military cross. Then came the bad news. Due to the severity of his injuries, Guy was found unfit for service and was to be shipped home to New Zealand. And there's a letter in his service medical file which gives a great insight into the man. Guy writes, I wish to state that I don't want my discharge and wish to return to France. I certainly have a slightly stiff arm, but I'm sure it would in no way affect the carrying out of the duties of an artillery officer. Trusting I may have your help in this matter, Lieutenant Guy Bridgman. In other words, he can't hold a rifle anymore, but he's pretty sure he can fire a big gun 